Good morning. Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, a special welcome to all of you online uh, through the magic of the internet. We have people watching from all around the world via the Washington Note, Prospects for Peace. Those are the two blogs of Steve Clemens and Daniel Levy, respectively, and also the New America Foundation website. My name is Jonathan Kolieb. I'm an International Affairs Research Associate at the Century Foundation. Uh, before we begin, I think a nice segue, a little, few little housekeeping matters. Aaron Miller's book is outside to be purchased, $27.50 bargain price. Um, for all those of you that haven't got a copy, I recommend it. Um, and then last piece of housekeeping, there are invitations at the back near the drinks for the DC Middle East Book Club for Young Professionals, which is a, a project of the Prospects for Peace Initiative at the Century Foundation. Just a, a, a nice venue forum for, for young folk, 25 to 45, uh, to, yeah, it's, it's getting more flexible every time we, um, uh, to, to chat about issues uh, in a fun, friendly and constructive atmosphere regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so I recommend you all take a, a copy of the, the flyer and suggest it to friends and family. Um, this morning we're here to discuss the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and specifically an assessment of where the situation is at now, prospects for the last months of the Bush administration and what we can hope for from the next administration. A little crystal ball gazing if you like. Um, we have three great panellists uh, to lead the conversation. <laughs> each bringing their own unique perspective to the issues. We have Aaron David Miller, Daniel Levy, and Gaith Alamari. Uh, for the past two decades, Aaron Miller served at the US Department of State as an advisor to six secretaries of state, where he helped formulate US policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli peace process, most recently as the senior advisor for Arab-Israeli negotiations. Between 2003 and 2006, he served as president of Seeds of Peace and is currently a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Aaron's latest book, Much Too Promised Land, as I just said, is uh, essential reading for any student of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Let me uh, jump to Gaith. Gaith served, Gaith al Omari served in various senior positions within the Palestinian Authority, including as advisor to the Palestinian president and former Prime Minister Mahmoud Abbas. He was also a member of the Palestinian negotiating team throughout the permanent status negotiations, including Camp David and Taba. After the breakdown of those negotiations, he was the lead Palestinian drafter of the unofficial Geneva Initiative Peace Accord, and Gaith is currently a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation. Daniel Levy has been special advisor in the Israeli Prime Minister's office, senior policy advisor to the Israeli Minister of Justice, and part of the Israeli negotiating teams during the Oslo process. 2001 Taba final status negotiations and a drafter, together with Gaith, of the unofficial Geneva Initiative. In 2003, he worked as an analyst for the International Crisis Group Middle East Program, and currently Daniel is a senior fellow and director of the Prospects for Peace Initiative at the Century Foundation, and a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Initiative at the New America Foundation. I hope we have everyone's titles correct. Let me get the ball rolling. I'm gonna ask a few leading questions to each of our three panelists. I'm gonna get them to try and engage one another afterwards and then open it up for plenty of time for Q and A from the, from the audience. Uh, I thought it would be good to, to frame the discussion actually with a quote from Aaron Miller's book. Um, which I thought was particularly relevant to, to a discussion like this. Um, one of Aaron's mentors, if, uh, I, I believe, was former Secretary of State James Baker. And uh, they had a, a wonderful relationship. And in an interview for this book, uh, former Secretary of State Baker uh, offered his father's, uh, one of his life's victims to, to Aaron Miller and perhaps poignant to this conversation and Arab-Israeli peacemaking in general. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. So as we're about to embark on a discussion about the future of Arab-Israeli peacemaking and perhaps some policy advice for future administration, I thought that was particularly poignant. So let me begin with you, Aaron. 
During your tenure at the State Department, dealing with Arab-Israeli issues, you've seen administrations come and go. What is your assessment of the Bush administration's handling of the Arab-Israeli issue? What grade would you give it? What will be the inheritance that it will leave for a President McCain or Obama? Yeah, Baker's quote in his five Ps was in response to my four Ts. Um, the four core ingredients that have characterized successful American diplomacy under two Republican secretaries of state, Henry Kissinger, James Baker, and one Democratic <coughs> president, Jimmy Carter. That's it. Those three were the most consequential Americans dealing with the Arab-Israeli peace process. Everyone else has failed. And I had four T's which sum up their diplomacy. Number one, each made it a top priority. A second, each was quite tough with both sides, particularly with the Israelis when appropriate. Each had an exquisite sense of timing. They understood how not to over-engage Bill Clinton, particularly in the last months uh, of an administration, or disengage George W. Bush. Uh, and finally, each was incredibly tenacious, the fourth T. Um, they didn't give up, uh, and they stuck with this um, as an American national interest. Not since James Baker and the first Bush administration have we seen, in my judgment, effective American diplomacy toward this issue. So I served in, for two years um, under Colin Powell in this administration. Um, I don't think much of its diplomacy. I understand it inherited a terrible hand, um, not in large part, but in part as a consequence of poor policies pursued by the previous administration, and I would put myself at the top of the list as a cheerleader for an unworkable policy during those days. Um, so uh, I, I called George W. Bush the great disengager. Uh, governing is about choosing. That's what it means to govern in Washington, at least based on my quarter of a century experience in government. You decide what's important to you and what isn't. And this administration had other priorities, bad hand or not. Uh, they have failed to manage and to take advantage of the one opportunity they did have. They did have, and there was only one, uh, in the fall of 2004, one legitimate opportunity. Arafat dies, presumably a natural death. Palestinian Authority does not implode, um, despite the predictions of people who thought they knew a great deal about Palestinian politics. The great leader is gone. Abu Mazen is elected with 60 plus percent of the popular vote in a fair and free election. Um, the Bush administration and the government of Israel's policies have come to pass, their dreams, their hopes, Arafat is gone. We have a essentially moderate but weak man now at the helm. Uh, and instead of pushing and arguably doing what they've been doing for the last year, they sat back. They let chance they let randomness and they let Ariel Sharon, who did have an, an agenda quite different than uh, the Bush administration's, define the terrain. As a consequence, I would say America lost an opportunity to at least manage this conflict and perhaps to pre preempt some of the developments which have now made it excruciatingly painful to imagine uh, a happy ending uh, anytime soon. Um, I would argue in the next six months, this administration, better late than never, um, ought to pursue three objectives under the rubric of the diplomatic equivalent to the Hippocratic Oath, which asserts, in my view, and I quote it in the book, uh, above all, do no harm. There are three pieces of good news. I would say they're fragile, tentative, hesitant pieces of good news. Um, they need to be supported and encouraged. One, whatever the Israelis and Palestinians are doing on permanent status, and the work is very rigorous, methodical, and very professional. They're going through these issues methodically, whatever they assert publicly, all four issues, including Jerusalem, uh, even though they deny it. Um, those discussions ought to be encouraged, codified, formalized to the degree that is possible, um, and Hopefully, they will be maintained by the end of the year. Number two, whatever is happening in the Israeli-Syrian negotiations, indirect, 
tentative, hesitant as they may be, that process ought to be not blocked or thwarted so that at the end of the administration, it, it too survives. And finally, um, at all costs, the administration should do whatever it can, limited though its influence is, to prevent a major confrontation which pushes Israel and Hamas into uh, a military escalation of a caliber we have not yet seen. If, in fact, these three pieces can be maintained and passed off to the next Republican or Democratic president, there's a possibility, remote though it may be, that um, serious and perhaps good things could happen um, next year. And so if I could just follow up, if, and it's a big if as you, as you suggest, <coughs> that those three object objectives are pursued for the next six months and there is some good news uh, that awaits the, the next president come January when he enters the Oval Office, how should he go about sort of tackling the remainder uh, of the issues or whatever's left on the table? How should he set up his administration? What policies right. in general should he pursue? It's really very difficult to predict and prophes prophesy about the future. Um, if the next administration inherits something that's workable, uh, it will not walk away. In fact, that, that's a, the sine qua non, because if the situation in January of 2009 is a catastrophe, the next administration will, just like this one, walk away from this issue about as fast as it possibly can. If it's stable and perhaps potentially productive, I would suggest four changes in what I call the software of American policy. Before we even get to figuring out what we should do on the ground, we have to change the way we look at the issue. Number one, is it a priority? If the President of the United States does not commit to this issue as one of the top issues in the next administration, it will go nowhere and empower his Secretary of State to work the issue. It will go nowhere. Above all, that is essential. Number two, there must be a chance of success. A new president, particularly if it is a young and untested president, will not want to have as a first act of policy a monumental failure. And I made this point before, and I'll make it again. The most compelling ideology in life in the human enterprise is not nationalism, it's not democracy, and it's not even capitalism. It's success, because success generates power and constituents, and failure generates the opposite. No president is going to want to take this on if he inherits a disaster. There must be a prospect of success. Number three, we are perceived in this re region, in my judgment, as weak, ineffective, and incompetent. We have failed for eight years in how to make peace under Bill Clinton, and we failed in eight years under George W. Bush about how to make war. And if you cannot make peace and you cannot make war, you are not a great power, you are not feared, you are not respected, and we are not in my judgment. So we need to start restoring our credibility as a regional player, and not necessarily through military preemptive or preventative action, but through tough and serious diplomacy at least test the proposition with those that we're not engaging with. And finally, the Israelis. And I'll make this point as abundantly clear as I possibly can. We need tactical flexibility, strategic independence in the way America conducts its policies with respect to the Arab-Israeli conflict. If we don't have it and we're not perceived to be independent, flexible and tactically agile, we will not succeed. If we are perceived to be the, a lawyer for one side and not a lawyer for an agreement, and after all, our client is an agreement, we have to be advocates for both sides. We will fail. And despite the moans and groans of the pro-Israeli community, this has nothing to do with compromising the special relationship with the Israelis, nothing at all. It merely means not allowing the special relationship to become what it has become, 
during the course of the last 16 years, eight under a Democratic president and eight under a Republican president. It has become an exclusive relationship where we can't say no to bad Israeli ideas, where we don't criticize inappropriate Israeli <laughs> behavior, and where we have to check everything, and this was as true in Clinton as it is here, with the Israelis before we act. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The special relationship we have with the State of Israel is critically important as an asset when we use it wisely, but when we don't, it becomes exclusive. And that's not good for America, and forgive me for being presumptuous here, I don't think it's good for the Israelis. Thank you, Aaron, for not holding back. Um, let's move on to Gape. Looking at the situation as it is today, balance that with the rhetoric coming out of Washington. We have the Annapolis process. We have talk of a deal by year's end. What's your take on, on how the last period of, of this Bush administration will deal with the Arab-Israeli issue? And what would you recommend uh, for the remaining six months? Thank you. And before I start, actually, just a logistical point or an organizational point. In addition to uh, my affiliations, you mentioned I'm also uh, at working with the American Task Force in Palestine. So I felt I have to say this. I come actually from two uh, paradigms, if you wish, two premises. The first is that the uh, current Annapolis process is very much US-led and dependent on US leadership, primarily because of the uh, weakness of both Abbas and uh, Olmert domestically and the fact that they cannot really take the initiative. And as a result of this assumption is the fact that uh, if the US leadership <laughs> disappears, as is inevitable to happen during a transition, I'm not sure that the uh, process as it stands now can withstand this kind of transition. The second point, which is one that uh, Aaron already made, um, if the next president uh, inherits an active conflict, or even uh, if he inherits a dead or a failed peace process, there will be very little incentive for such an American uh, president to engage, and the peace process will go the same way it went at the beginning of the Bush administration. So the focus in the next uh, six months should be on strengthening the process and enabling it to uh, withstand the few months of transition until the new administration uh, sets itself up and defines its priorities. To do that, you would need, uh, I would uh, argue, a four-pronged uh, approach to foreign policy. But before I do that, though, let me just uh, comment on one aspect of what I see things are today. I think one of the biggest mistakes of the Bush administration in the Annapolis process, which was, I disagree actually with Aaron, which was the second uh, opportunity that they could have had to make a difference. The first was the Arafat, but the second one was the Annapolis process. They could have made a difference, it could have been a successful process, but they approached it, I believe, in the wrong way by focusing too much on the attractive, visible uh, objective of reaching a peace, uh, a big peace deal by the end of the year, and totally neglected things on the ground. So movement on the peace process, movement on the negotiations have proceeded in a good, pa good pace, but it was not felt by the public on both sides. And therefore, the process had no credibility and very little public support. And even though there is a lot of good progress in the negotiations, by its very nature, it cannot be made public and as such has no political influence. So we have to start using the next few months to uh, remedy this. And as I said, it has to be a four-pronged approach. One relates to permanent status. What do we do with the progress that has been made with, uh, on uh, the big issues, Jerusalem, refugees, uh, security, borders? The idea that's being floated right now is the idea of, create, of recording the progress, and I think Aaron mentioned it. Basically creating a document that, uh, that says this is where the Palestinians are, this is where the Israelis are. This is a good, in theory, a good uh, proposal, but it's a very risky one. And we've tried it in the past. We've tried it when we were negotiating both formally and informally. And what happens when you try to get the two sides to sit together uh, and codify what progress they made is each side becomes very conservative in its, in its interpretation of its positions. And they usually revert back to the opening positions and try to give the most liberal interpretation to the other side's positions and try to create and try to uh, read concessions that were not made. What happens in these attempts is basically the two sides revert to their opening positions. There has to be, if this is to succeed, it has to be done by a third party, it has to be done by the Americans, and they have to be willing to be tough on both sides and to be tough in their interpretation of where things are. This is the first uh, component. We have to start approaching permanent status in a way that does not force the two sides 
to revert to their opening positions. Then we need on both sides, Palestinians and Israelis, we need major political action to send the signal to the other side that they are serious about negotiations. On the Israeli side, there has to be a settlement freeze. If there is no settlement freeze, it's hard to see how Abbas will go back to his public and say the Israelis are serious. He will be asked the question, if they are serious, why are they taking land right now? This is essential to send the right kind of message to the Palestinian public. On the Palestinian side, it has to be security. More active, more rigorous, more vigorous action on security to send the message to the Israelis that there is seriousness on uh, the Palestinian side. The third component is CBMs, confidence building measures. And these, by their very nature, these are sugar coating. These are things that are, uh, should be intended, should be uh, used to create a sense of movement, which means two things. First of all, they should not become points of contention. What we've seen repeatedly in negotiations in the past is that the two sides sit, negotiate about how many prisoners, I mean, it happened to me personally. I remember once negotiating with an Israeli uh, senior official about how many prisoners we're going to be releasing. We were asking for 500. They were talking about 300. And we spent two weeks negotiating this. In the end, we got around 400. And everyone left with a very bitter feeling. There was no confidence built in this. There were actually confidence lost. And therefore, this has to be done in a smart way, look at the things that are easy to implement but have high uh, dividend on the other side. Things like, uh, for example, incitement on the Palestinian side, which is easy to implement. Things like uh, prisoner releases, opening some Jerusalem institutions on the Israeli side. Things that send the, uh, the right kind of signal. But also, in this regard, timing is essential. These should be dispersed. These should be used in a tactical way in the right time to create ongoing sense of progress. And this, by the way, is where the U.S. can be most effective because on the permanent status issues, at the end of the day, the two sides will move at their own pace. You cannot force them to reach decisions on such existential issues. But on CBMs, the U.S. can be very effective, but this requires an ongoing presence on the ground and ongoing diplomacy. One of the problems with this administration is that diplomacy has been defined as the secretary flying in once a month, once every six weeks, doing what she does. She leaves and there's a vacuum uh, behind her. And the envoys that we have seen have been uh, rotating too quickly for any of them to take hold, with the exception of uh, Keith Dayton, who doesn't have a bilateral uh, agenda. We have to have a more systematic, engaged uh, American role on the ground. The fourth uh, approach, uh, the fourth issue is uh, avoid a Hamas-Israel war at any cost. If such a war, if a major scale Israeli invasion of uh, Gaza happens, two things would happen. First of all, uh, it will kill the peace process and the prospects of uh, restarting it anytime soon. But from a partisan perspective, I think more importantly, it, it will fail. Putting aside all of the humanitarian and human costs, I cannot see a scenario where an Israeli attack on Gaza would actually produce its uh, desired political uh, outcomes. What we will have is a new Lebanon, whereby Hamas is strengthened. We go back to uh, where we started, and there will be no uh, political gain, and there will be a lot of humanitarian and other losses in the process. The last point that I want to make is these are all responsibilities of the current administration. However, I think there will be responsibilities for the president-elect come November. The president should not, by any means, start uh, presenting their very detailed policy approach to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, process. This requires the creation of a new team and the, the, the deciding who is the secretary of state is going to be. But the president has to signal from the very beginning that he is uh, going to focus and tackle this issue early on. There have to be statements, be it Obama, be it McCain, that this is going to be a priority. This is essential in sending the message back in the region, allowing someone like Abbas to say, look, I'm going to continue with the process because we know there's going to be an American president who's engaged. Okay. Okay. Uh, my follow-up to you, I guess, you, you mentioned Hamas um, in, in the context of an is Israeli-Hamas war. Uh, let me broaden it a little. Palestinian politics. <laughs> Um, it's a mess. Uh, we have uh, the West Bank and Gaza are physically divided and politically Hamas is in power in one, Fatah in the other, um, both with their own internal uh, problems. Where are the bright spots in the Palestinian politics and, and how should America handle Palestinian politics? Okay, um, there are no bright spots, so let's get that out of the way. Um, how should America handle this? Uh, I think, on the one hand, I mean, uh, I think America is right in its decision not to engage Hamas for uh, legal, political, ideological value reasons. I think the U.S. is there, and I think, anyways, the new president, even if they wished to do it, and I 
know that neither of them wishes to engage Hamas, wishes to engage Hamas. They cannot, and so that's not even uh, a question. I think the main recommendation to the, uh, to the administration, though, is uh, leave domestic Palestinian politics to Palestinians. Palestinians know their uh, balance of power. They know their domestic scene better than anyone else. You know, I see myself as an expert on domestic Palestinian politics, and for the life of me, I cannot translate it into a systematic way that's understandable to a Western mind. It's very obscure, it's very... And so Palestinians know it best. And every time that an outside uh, player, particularly the Americans, tried to uh, manipulate Palestinian politics, it always backfired. We saw that in Camp David, we saw that in so many other places. Don't try to manipulate it. Leave it to the Palestinians to sort it out. On the other hand, you have a very clear Palestinian address with the, uh, for dealing with. It's uh, President Abbas, he's the legitimate Palestinian leader. Deal with him, but do not block his attempts to maneuver his own domestic politics. If we come to a point where Abbas feels that this is a time to uh, strike a deal with Hamas, one has to assume that he does it based on his uh, considerations, on his readings of Palestinian politics. Don't block this. Are there prospects of this? Uh, the prospects, I, th I think, are very dim. I still believe that the mindset in both Fatah and Hamas is a zero-sum game. They're both approaching their dialogue as a way they're trying to position to, as a way of trying to destroy the other side. There are fundamental issues that have not been dealt with and will not be dealt with in the near future. For example, the issue of weapons, who's going to have weapons, who's not going to have weapons. Is Hamas going to disarm? Is Hamas going to be integrated into the security system? Is the security system going to be moved from the uh, monopoly from Fatah? So these are all fundamental things that, in my view, bar the possibility of a uh, rapprochement at the moment. But if the moment comes, do not block it. Let the Palestinians manage it the way that uh, they know how to manage it. Thank you. Daniel. Daniel, lucky last. But, but really, it's the same question that uh, I asked of, of Aaron and Gaith as well. As we count down to January, um, we have a new, Amer new American president taking the oath of office. Um, the six months in between now and then, is it a black hole or is there achievable successes or uh, ways to strengthen prospects for peace in the, in the coming administration? And, and if I can put a little edgier spin on it for you, are there, are there some policy options that we simply should not be embarking upon in the next six months? That, thanks. I'll try, I'll try and respond with edginess, but I don't know if I'll succeed. Um, I, actually, my point of departure in answering your question would, would be something Wraith just said. And it, it, it it's one of the areas that has least to do with the administration, which is try and let this ceasefire breathe, try and make it work, and as you said, Wraith, prevent uh, an absolute catastrophe between Israel and Gaza. Um, my reading is that active American opposition to the ceasefire, which probably existed early on, no longer exists. Um, but this is going to be a really, a, it's a really fragile, shaky thing, as people who follow the news have seen. There have been uh, I think it's half a dozen, although I think there may have been a couple more today, uh, rockets landed in uh, uh, basically open areas in Israel, launched from Gaza since the declaration of the ceasefire uh, eight days ago now. There have been two um, Palestinian fatalities in an IDF operation uh, targeting militants in the West Bank, in Nablus. Uh, there are a couple of firing incidents from Israel into Gaza. The, there has been um, a reimposition of significant elements of the closure. So this is very shaky, but that was eminently predictable. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone expected that, that everything would go swimmingly. What I think we're seeing right now with the ceasefire, which is why I think patience and breathing space are the key things, what I think we're seeing is everyone testing the parameters, seeing how far one can push the envelope in the new rules of the game, really trying to work out what those new rules of the game are. We knew that it would be tricky if the ceasefire did, didn't extend to the West Bank because things in the West Bank would carry over to Gaza. We knew that the pace of opening up of the crossings by Israel would not satisfy Hamas. Uh, 
we knew that other factions would want to embarrass and undermine Hamas. I mean, in a way, I think, for instance, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, you know, it wants to provoke Hamas into actively moving against them so they can say you're just the same as Abbas. And Hamas now faces the Abbas dilemma, which is why I think some of the rockets came actually from Fatah affiliated militias. Because now they're saying, okay, you be Israel's security subcontractor, just like you accuse us of being. And Wraith knows this very well. So we're, we're in a new game. Thankfully, by the way, I think we have an extremely level-headed chief of staff uh, in the IDF right now, um, Gabi Ashkenazi, who I, I see as, as someone who's a key mover right now behind a lot of what is going on. And he's doing this um, in a very low-profile way. My impression is he doesn't have the political ambitions of our, of our last chiefs of staff, which I think has, 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 I think has been a terrible cost, actually, in terms of their management of the IDF, but, but, but I don't want to go too far in that direction. Look, I, 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 I'll pick up on, on, on what has been said elsewhere in terms of what one can do. So trying to make the ceasefire work, showing patience is, 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 is crucial. But in terms of what one can do and what one shouldn't do, which is what you, you, you said. The first thing I'd say to this administration is remember your ABCs. When the administration came into office, it was anything but Clinton <coughs> was the ABC. Don't do what the last people did. And I'd say right now is a really good time to remember it, even if it seems a bit retro seven, seven years plus later. Because the one thing that I would recommend not doing is trying to force through an agreement between Olmert and Abbas to sign up to a piece of paper, any piece of paper, between now and the end of this administration. Don't impose an American political timetable on a Middle East reality that is not up <coughs> to handling it right now. What could one do? The, uh, the two ideas that I'd suggest, and, and, and they're both imperfect, um, one Wraith hinted at. When we finished our Tuba negotiations in Jan 2001, the then European Special Envoy, he's now the Spanish Foreign Minister, Miguel Moratinos, produced a, a document called the Moratinos Paper, which tried to give a snapshot of where we were. The problem was that it wasn't a hugely accurate snapshot, and it was the EU, not the Americans. Now, uh, the only way I think that exercise is worth considering repeating is if this is an American paper that's placed in a safe that isn't a public paper. We could call it the David Welch paper. It would be a, an attempt at an accurate reflection of where the parties are at. I think because everyone assumes it will be leaked, it won't happen. Uh, I'm not sure you can capture the snapshot because of the reasons that Wraith raised. The other idea, which I'm also hesitant to put out there, is you have a repeat of the Clinton parameters of December 2000, but done totally differently. Um, in December of 2000, uh, after Camp David, um, you know, in that interregnum between the election in November and, and, and the, the lame duck period, President Clinton presented parameters to the two parties. But he said, I'm taking them home with me if you don't get this done by the end of your presidency. This is not something I leave behind. If this administration were up to the task of saying, we have encouraged negotiations since Annapolis in November 2007, we'd have liked to have seen those negotiations successfully concluded in 2008, but we're not going to do what the Clinton administration did and force an American timetable. There has been progress, and we would like to now present where we see things moving and where we think they need to get to to actually achieve a two-state solution. If they got the content right, I mean, the two crucial things here, I think, would be A, getting the content right, which the track record here is not good. The letters from President Bush to then Israeli Prime Minister Sharon in April 2004 do not hold out hope that they'd get the content right. But if they got the content right, and if they choreographed this with the incoming president-elect, then I would see some possible value in doing this. In other words, the, the, the president-elect says, wow, that's a fabulous uh, help you've given me. I'm going to work with the parameters that you laid down. Uh, perhaps the Turks could do something similar on the Syrian track.
And the thing not to do, I've said, is, is, is don't push forward a paper. Um, the one other comment I'd make is, 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 is also picking up on something Ray said, which I, where, where I, I think I, I may disagree on something. Um, look, I don't think that, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict lends itself to, to being managed. Um, I, I don't know if you can make much progress while there's still an occupation there and, and the distrust on both sides and the insecurity on both sides that, uh, that is a consequence of that occupation. But I've kind of say the following. If your decision is that you're going to try to manage this conflict, manage it. If your decision is you're going to try to resolve this conflict, try to resolve it. Don't get stuck in a place where over a lengthy period of time you're trying to do both. And I think that's what's happened post Annapolis. The agreement on paper is doable if the political will exists. And if the political will doesn't exist, then an extension of time, I would argue, will not create it. It doesn't take a year or even six months or even four months to negotiate a permanent status Palestinian-Israeli agreement. If you're negotiating that, then I'd go with the sugar coating part of what, what, what Gaith presented to us. If you need a three month period to get the negotiation done, do the sugar coating. Because if it's going to take longer, you're not going to get traction on settlements, on security, etc. And it doesn't need to take longer. And if you're hearing positions from the parties, if the Palestinian party is saying, listen, when we say right of return, we mean right of return. <coughs> Anything short of that, we won't agree to then you're not in a place where you can get closure. And if the Israeli party says, listen, we're going to annex 10% of the West Bank, maybe nine and a half, maybe eight and a quarter, and there's not going to be a one-to-one -one land swap, and forget Jerusalem, then you're not in a place where there's going to be closure. If you see you're not in that place, then my advice would be focus everything on the management. Then say, we absolutely respect your position, Israeli Prime Minister. We're not going to force you. These are existential questions for your country as far as you see them. But we're going to keep the option alive. And keeping the option alive means we're going to every day address settlements and checkpoints. I don't think an Israeli Prime Minister will find it very comfortable if, if an administration is really trying to address those questions. I asked Gaith about Palestinian politics. I want to ask you about Israeli politics. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about what, uh, what the Israeli leadership might look like for the next US administration. Prime Minister Olmert is uh, the current occupier of the prime ministership, but he seems to be dodging crises left and right. Um, there's a lot of elector electoral uncertainty. We have a new third, uh, third party in Israel. Um, is the instability endemic? Mm. What, will, what will the next administration have to deal with in terms of Israeli domestic politics? Look, I mean, right now, in the immediate term, it's, there still is a decision-making capacity. I think the first thing one should say is there still is. The fact that this government could agree to a ceasefire and is likely to agree to a prisoner exchange uh, with Hezbollah on Sunday means that there still is a capacity to take decisions, to, to continue the Syrian tracks, Syrian peace track. I think that capacity is limited. Uh, I don't think it, it stretches as far as reaching an agreement on paper with the Palestinians. Um, I mean, right now, you also, everyone is in campaign mode. So I think there are things that the leadership of Olmert's own party won't let him do. You, I, I think you'd be hard pushed to find uh, uh, anyone in Israel, an, an, an analyst, a commentator, who would tell you that the next president will be dealing with Prime Minister Olmert. Uh, certainly beyond a very, I mean, theoretically, we're in an election campaign in Israel uh, in January, and Olmert is the caretaker prime minister, theoretically. Um, basically, there, there, are, there are two options. Either Kadima elect a new leader in a primary, the um, front runners are Sipi Livni and Shaul Mofaz, the foreign and transportation minister, respectively. And that <coughs> newly elected Kadima leader manages to form a new coalition and avoid elections in Israel. And the new coalition would probably look the same as the outgoing coalition. Uh, under that scenario, if elections had been avoided, my assumption is the incoming Israeli prime minister wants to kind of get their feet under the table and, 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 and would, would, 
you know, be looking at a horizon of one, one and a half years. We don't have to have elections till I think it's November 2010 in Israel. The other option is that either uh, Omer doesn't go willingly and elections are forced, or the Kadima primary is a mess, or the newly elected Kadima leader cannot put together a new coalition. All of the above leads to um, early elections. So, so that's the short term, what, what, the, uh, what, what the next pre pre Israel American president may be dealing with. In the polls right now, Netanyahu is most likely, if there are elections, to form the next government. Uh, there have been polls that suggest a Kadima headed by Tsipi Livni um, would give, uh, give Netanyahu a serious challenge. Um, yeah, Israeli politics is unpredictable. Uh, two days ago, when the vote to disband the Knesset was avoided, um, uh, Bibi Netanyahu was, was not a happy camper. Um, because he knows that six to nine months is an awfully long time in terms of his own popularity. But the endemic question is the question, and, and I'll, I'll just close by, by, by referring to that. And, and Aaron actually talks about this in the book. Um, look, Israeli politics is, 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 is way more dysfunctional than I think people take into account here. Um, Israel has a parliament of 120 members there are 13 different factions represented, parties represented in that parliament. You know, it's not like you've got blue dog Democrats and progressive Democrats. These are different parties that answer to different, often very sectarian, even ethnic constituencies. In addition to the 13 formal parties, there are parties within parties, but literally different parties who just formed an alliance in the election. And there are perhaps 20 of those represented in the parliament. Is it, the fractiousness of Israeli coalition politics has reached a level where there is a, stru a, a structural weight that a prime minister carries around, which it serves as a huge uh, factor in an inability to make big decisions. We have serious policy planning um, difficulties, which the investigation into the 2006 Lebanon summer war uh, pointed out. These are, these are real, real problems for Israel. Um, there's, there's, you know, we don't have a presidential system. There's no clear definition uh, of powers between the executive and the legislative. We have a parliamentary democracy where you have a super fractious parliament. Now, on top of all that, of course, Israel's dealing with questions which, which actually require resolution. But the tendency of Israeli politics is always to postpone, 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 because you can't take big decisions. Look, I don't want to rule out the possibility that Israel could reform that system or that you could get a leader with a sufficient majority, let's say, you know, Sipi Livni, the election is, is about clean government. <clears throat> and Netanyahu and Barak both have their own records of police investigations, and Sipi emerges and takes the country by storm. Not inconceivable. Netanyahu wins with a clear, clearish majority and puts together a strong coalition. Decides not to go with the right-wing extremes, but to form a, a unity government and shows strong leadership and passes reform. Not inconceivable. My guess is those things aren't going to happen, which probably means that the outside cajoler, someone cajoling Israeli politics, if you want to take decision-making in a, in a definitive direction, is more necessary, which, which goes back to the American role. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we open it up to uh, audience questions, I just have a few uh, questions of my own to follow up with the, with the panel. Um, Aaron, first to you. Gaithan, and, and to some extent Daniel, basically said, leave Palestinian and, and Israeli politics to the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, America perhaps doesn't have the luxury of doing that as, as a past and perhaps future policymaker. Um, how should America deal with the tempestuous politics of, of these two uh, polities? Yeah, you know, we, we aren't good at this sort of thing. Uh, we can barely manage our own system in an effort to get a cohesive, coherent policy that makes sense and has a prospect of success. And we get ourselves into trouble when we think we understand um, these respective systems and we have individuals in our system who maintain contacts with both sides, who think they understand, uh, and they become, in their own right, 
issues in the negotiations and in the politics of both sides. None of this makes sense to me. We have to figure out a way, <clears throat> as the great power we hope to be, and <clears throat> we're not now, to rise above all of this pettiness, understanding the, in an empathetic way, the realities of these smaller powers and the politics that drive them. But we need to look to an America first paradigm in terms of protecting our own interests. I care less, frankly, about what happens to Israelis and Palestinians right now, and much more about what's happening here um, and the way in which we are perceived. Um, I, can only, I can only tell you that I, I, um, I do not look back on the past 16 years of, of American maneuvering in this process with a great deal of confidence that the next administration, whether it's Republican or Democrat, uh, will find a better way forward. Because we are, we become our own worst enemy. And I'm not sure we can fix this. We certainly can't fix the dysfunction that exists in these respective political systems. I mean, the Palestinian Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall and cracked into two parts. And we are deluding ourselves in the extreme if we believe that Anything other than a unified Palestinian house, one gun, one authority, one negotiating position, can even begin to move forward toward a conflict ending solution to the Israeli Palestinian conflict. It's a delusion. It's an illusion that America cannot afford to, to embrace any longer. Uh, Henry Kissinger once famously said that Israel has no foreign policy, it just has domestic politics. I think that's somewhat overstated, but there is a reality here. 31 governments since independence, since 1948. Many of those have been internal reconstitutions of existing governments. But what Daniel says is absolutely right. Where is the leader empowered with the moral authority and the legitimacy on either side, supported by their respective systems, to make these existential decisions. Well, there is no leadership. So my, my argument is, on this one, stay away. Okay. Um, Gabe, to you, I think. Um, Aaron, in his book, um, at beginning and end and, and throughout, really stresses the indispensability of America's role in Middle East peacemaking. And as an un-American, as I'm sure you can all tell from the accent, I question such uh, assumptions, um, especially over the past eight years where American administration has been so disengaged, um, as you've all acknowledged, um, especially considering that other countries now have stepped up to fill the void. We have Egypt, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, all offering their own sort of mediating um, of this issue or that. Is America still the indispensable power for Middle East peace? Um, most certainly. Um, America disengaged in the last eight years and we saw how great the last eight years were. I mean, it's essential for America to play a, a role for two reasons, really, at least. Uh, the first is the one that I think was mentioned before, the special relation that America has with uh, Israel. Um, the U.S. is the only country that Israel feels comfortable with. The U.S. is the only country that uh, Israel can respond to. It's the only country that creates the comfort zone, if you wish, the level of comfort for uh, Israel to be able to make the necessary uh, kind of uh, <coughs> progress. No matter how much the Europeans or others want to engage, uh, at the end of the day, they cannot lead the process. But the absence of uh, an American role has created a number of players who are trying to uh, do things some for good intentions, some for less than uh, good intentions, some with good results, some with uh, worse results. Uh, I would argue, for example, what uh, Qatar has done uh, is not sustainable simply because uh, I can't see the Saudis allowing Qatar to be developed like a regional superpower. You've seen when the uh, Egyptians try to do something, how the Saudis try to undermine them. There is a dynamic there. If you don't have adult supervision, if you don't have a leadership of some sort, this will uh, continue to play in its own very small microcosm. Uh, now, that said, American leadership does not mean American monopoly. 
And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we've seen repeatedly by uh, American administrations, saying we're leading and we're not going to create a place for anyone else to play a role. And I think it's very important in the defining of the next foreign policy is to see how do you revive multila multilateralism. How do you create roles for specific players who might be better placed to do it than the U.S.? But the U.S. has to create the framework. In particular, I would say engage the Arabs. I think a mistake that we saw in Camp David and we saw again in Annapolis is that you remember the Arabs when there is like a big event. That's when you're able to call uh, the Saudi king or the Egyptian uh, president and expect them to come wholeheartedly and support your process and pay a political price. They're not going to do that. If you don't engage them from the beginning in a way that addresses their uh, national interest, in a way that makes it attractive for them to engage, in a way that gives them a level of, I don't know, uh, <sighs> dignity in dealing with this, then you've uh, blocked them out. So be the leader, but also choreograph how others play so that you can have a well-nuanced uh, foreign policy. Um, Daniel, uh, last softball to you. Um, you all mentioned the need to avoid and prevent a Hamas-Israel war. But it seems to me there's another war that is uh, over the horizon, a Middle East war that everyone is talking about, especially in recent weeks. The 500-pound gorilla in the room, which none of you mentioned, Iran. Um, so uh, the West and Israel seem determined that Tehran not get the bomb. Um, we just had the, the recent uh, exercise um, over the Mediterranean, Israeli Air Force exercise. Um, diplomacy has so far yielded little. Um, how important is it for Israeli-Palestinian peace pros prospects for the U.S. to get this right? And, and you've also got people who weren't always wrong in their predictions as to what America, this administration might do, like John Bolton and Bill Kristol appearing all over the place telling us there's going to be a uh, military action against Iran. Um, prior to the to, to, to new president taking office. Um, I don't see the steps that Israel has been taking recently on the diplomatic front as disconnected from uh, the Iran issue, by the way. Um, I do think that there is an Iran connection to the fact that uh, Israel is talking to Syria, to the fact that Israel is uh, go trying to have this ceasefire with Hamas. Um, I think there's something of an Iran connection also to the Qatar brokered um, Lebanon deal. But, 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 but I think the, the, the American piece is one of the missing pieces in this. Look, first let me say, I think it would, it would the, uh, a, 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 an Israeli military strike or any, any military strike on Iran, I think would be a, a, an error of huge proportions. Um, we, we can go into why if we want, but I, I just want to put that out there. Um, I think one of the things that Israel's addressing right now is that there are two sides to the Iran leverage coin. I think it's very interesting that Secretary of Defense Gates and General Petraeus has said this, and I believe that um, Admiral Mullen has said this as well, um, have talked recently about increase your leverage vis-a-vis -vis Iran in advance of, of in constructively engaging with Iran, because that will increase the likelihood of success in that engagement. I actually see some of what Israel is doing as falling into that increasing your leverage. What do I mean by that? What the, the, the one side of the leverage coin is, is, is what we hear about all the time. Sanctions, imposing more sanctions, finance, trade, Iranian banks, etc. But there's another side of the leverage coin, which is can you begin to blunt Iranian leverage in the region? Can you begin to blunt the instruments that Iran can deploy? And if Hamas is locked into a ceasefire, Hamas, which anyway is not an Ira Iranian proxy, actually there's a discomfort level on the Palestinian side because Hamas doesn't like to be accused of being Shia or Persian. Well, I think the international community was dumb in pushing Hamas further into the Iran direction. If Hamas is locked into a ceasefire, then it's very difficult for to Hamas to turn around and say, our, our relationship with Iran is more important than our loyalty to the citizens of Gaza. So we'll just start shooting rockets at Iran's request. Iran will still try to mobilize renegade elements on the Palestinian side from all kinds of factions to do that. Likewise in Lebanon. If Hezbollah is locked into a Lebanese domestic arrangement, then it has to first and foremost serve its Lebanese Shia constituency. 
Likewise, um, Israel working with Syria. So I think those are smart moves, but they, they're not leading up to any American engagement. I think the bigger picture is that, that I think we made a mistake in Annapolis by in large measure defining Annapolis as, Annapolis was defined at least as much as the anti-Iran conference as it was as the peacemaking conference. And I think by doing that, we kind of enhanced what was anyway a sense of growing Iranian power in the region. You have to bring all these foreign ministers and the whole world together just to stick it in the eye. I, I, I fear that America and Israel may be the losers in a new Middle East. Uh, and I think that, I, I think that one of the most important things the next administration could do would be to begin, and it would be a very torturous process, but begin to construct a regional security architecture in the Middle East which would have to include Iran, and it would have to include and take into account Israel's uh, security interests. Right now, America is putting troops and treasure into the Middle East in order to guarantee its own oil security and interests primarily. But it's America that's carrying this entire load on its own. China, without investing anything in that arena, has its energy security guaranteed. The Gulf countries, which are enjoying huge windfall profits off the rise in oil prices and not having to pay for most of this, I don't understand why that is a smart way for America to go about how it works in the Middle East. Because while it's doing all of this, America is still hated in the region. Which, and, and you have to see the and hated because of its policies much more than... Uh, than its freedoms, uh, I, I would argue. So I think you have to see the interconnectedness. But, but I, I think the Iran issue is, is I, I'm, 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 I've not been someone who's been ringing alarm bells, but, but I think the recent events mean that we should be a little more, um, a little more concerned. I do think that the, the Pentagon may play a crucial role in, in anything crazy not happening. Okay. Thank you very much. On that note, we have lots of issues um, on the table. Lots of food for thought. Let's open it up to audience questions. I think the way we're going to do this is we're going to have one roving microphone. Uh, Samir, Ben, do you want to? Oh, um, a few rules. Please wait for the microphone, as I just did. Please wait for the microphone, especially for our web audience. Otherwise, they won't be able to hear you. Uh, please state your name and affiliation. And uh, we all have our opinions. Please ask questions. Questions. We want a discussion. Thank you. Okay, anyone have a question? Uh, Chia Chen, freelance correspondent. From three speakers, it seems uh, there's uh, no hope uh, for the next uh, six months. And uh, all need is, uh, is uh, political will. So maybe next uh, year and uh, for the US, U.S., maybe take a couple of months and easily have an e election process. So I would, uh, I would uh, like to know at what time then the three countries have some leader, have some uh, political will and the strength to implement this. Thank you. Past is a useful guide. I mean, we can't be imprisoned by it, but it's it's really irresponsible to ignore it. Um, and I'll only speak for America here. Um, we have succeeded in the Arab-Israeli peacemaking only under one of two conditions: where crisis, usually generated by insurgency or war, has moved fundamentally a regional situation. Um, or in response to opportunity. And I'll, I'll repeat it again. There are, th there are only three successes, American successes, in 50 years of Arab-Israeli peacemaking. Henry Kissinger's disengagement diplomacy of the early 70s, which was made possible by the October 1973 war. Uh, Jimmy Carter's efforts at Camp David, which was made possible in large part by Sadat's unilateral diplomacy. And the first President Bush and Jim Baker, who used the Gulf War, another act of violence, 
and the um, collapse of the former Soviet Union to capitalize on changing circumstances and to put together a, a, a peace conference at Madrid. I'm not suggesting they're all three equivalent accomplishments. They're not. But what motivated them, there's, there's a unifying theme here. If there's no crisis of a sufficient nature to change the calculations of the Arabs and the Israelis, and no opportunity to attract an administration reluctant to engage in a, a hundred year headache, then there will be no serious American role. This is something that has to be grasped and understood. The raw material required to allow America to do what it can do when it asserts itself and, and conducts itself wisely, that raw material comes out of either pain on one hand or prospects of gain on the other. If the status quo prevails, and I would sit, submit to you without being callous or cavalier or perverse, that the sufficient level of pain that Arabs and Israelis are prepared to inflict on one another and absorb on themselves has by no means reached the point where the status quo in their calculations is worth fundamentally challenging. So I cannot change that. America can never change that. And there are those who argue that we should impose or dispose. We should find a way to prime the pump. American activism can create political will. It is, in my judgment, it is a fantasy and an illusion. And it will embroil an outside power, America, in something it doesn't need right now, which is another failure. We have plenty of those. Just look around. So the, a balance has to be struck between the party's capacities to move and America's willingness to assume control. And as Kissinger said in his interview with me, the threads have to be pulled together by an outside hand, but the threads have to exist to begin with. And I will challenge and fight to the last breath of, of my <laughs> humble existence to avert another unilateral act of peacemaking on the part of my country that fails. We don't need one of those, particularly when they are encouraged by Israelis who don't share our interests across the board, or Arabs and or Palestinians who also don't share our interests across the board. Sorry for the rant, but it's a critically important point. Effective introduction line to an Israeli and Palestinian pushback, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, look, uh, in many ways, leaders are not always born. Sometimes they're made. And uh, someone like uh, Abbas, obviously, the issue of political will is something that uh, the leaders will have to decide for themselves. But the issue of political capacity is something that one can help uh, create. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that you need to create a situation on the ground that people see progress, that there are real prospects for getting a result, whereby you create, you create a situation where someone like Abbas, where his message uh, gains traction domestically. So if he decides, if he gets a political will to move in the right direction, at least he has a political capacity. And for that, as I mentioned earlier, you need two things. You need to stabilize Gaza, and you need to start showing there is a level of progress uh, on the ground. Daniel said that we cannot manage the, pro uh, the process. Absolutely. The process, I mean, every time that we try to manage uh, the conflict, it always de deteriorated. However, management that is for a very specific time and for a very specific purpose can A, preserve the peace process, B, create the political context in which someone like Abbas can then, once you have a new administration, if he so desires, can have the capacity to uh, move. We know one thing for sure, if things continue to deteriorate on the ground, if people see no difference, then definitely there will be no capacity if, even if there is will, which is what we have today. So I argue that U.S. behavior, foreign policy, the state of the peace process is very much an integral part of creating the domestic political uh, sense. And this is what we have to be playing with in the next few months. I, I, I guess I'd also say that 
a, a situation in which oil is it is at $140 a barrel, 150,000 American troops are stationed in Iraq, and there's a prospect of military confrontation with Iran, strikes me as not being so far from a crisis. Um, I think the entire Iraq situation was a, was a possible crisis, and I think that was the logic that the Iraq study group tried to apply, that your crisis here is region-wide, and you have to address it region-wide. Um, the other example I'd, I'd say, Aaron, and you were part of both of these, so it's interesting how you respond to this. Now, they didn't lead to a, to a resolution of the conflict, but I think they led to openings that were made partial progress and were partially not sufficiently exploited. I think America had a crucial role in defining the direction of Israeli politics in 9192, when an American administration made settlements one of the defining issues in the election of Yitzhak Rabin. And in 98, 99, when Bibi Netanyahu, uh, and, and done in a more perhaps sophisticated way under President Clinton with the Y River Agreement, where Netanyahu could not continue to play both sides of this, of, well, I'll, I'll try and keep a, 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 a totally recalcitrant, recalcitrant coalition and pretend to move forward on a peace process. And those both created openings. Now, if it's an American interest, I'd say that one, you know, I'm not saying come and define Israeli politics, but I think right now, and, and, and under Sharon, America in different ways is playing a role in defining Israeli politics. So I, I think in both of those instances, you, you actually saw movement politically as a consequence of um, how America chose to, to engage in this. I, I also think you've kind of got, you've got something of a realization in Israel that, uh, uh, that the status quo cannot go on indefinitely. My recommendation to the Israeli side is be a little bit more instrumental. I don't think it's gonna happen, but uh, I, I think there's a huge Israeli interest in locking in um, its own recognized borders with its Arab neighbors and getting acceptance from the Arab world while American power has still not declined further. But uh, that's a separate issue. Let's take another question. Over this side. Thanks. Uh, Robert Rosenberg, uh, Freight Test Technologies. My question is, um, um, going outside the political actors, do you see any trends or activities happening uh, with the Israeli and Palestinian non-political actors, such as the private sector and business community, that are getting out in front of the political process and creating a uh, positive reality or, or the potential for that? Or do you, if not, do you see anything that they should be doing to get out in front and move it along? I, mean, I see these, whether in the private sector or the people-to-people, -people, all of this kind of thing. I see it as part of the sugar coating what a category, in that on its own, it's not sustainable. And we've seen it in the past over and over again. Uh, political reality over, always overtakes uh, this. However, if deployed in the right moment, if deployed uh, properly, it can create the right kind of uh, environment. If you have economic progress, if you, uh, then people will uh, have more incentive to go for peace. But ultimately, these are secondary. And what we've seen, at, again, during this administration, at least in the first uh, phase of this administration, is defining the conflict as a technical one rather than a political one and thinking that we throw money and we throw security assistance, that's going to solve it. That's not going to solve it. It's a, it's a precondition or at least it helps solving it. But it, in itself, it's not sustainable. So I would say don't focus too much on that focus on it in a the directed way and in a way that will ultimately feed into the political process. But there's no replacement for that. Um, Irish Shapiro, Greenberg, Traurig, former Clinton administration trade official. Um, I'm struck by Aaron's formulation, sort of a combination of realism and pessimism. Uh, but the reason I'm struck by it is that I find it almost inconceivable that the next president will not feel the need to be deeply engaged, irrespective of how bad the situation is later in the year or come January. And while I share your view that the worst 
you know, one of the worst things that could happen uh, for the next president is a failure uh, in the Middle East. Non-engagement uh, has its own consequences, as you know, where better than anyone, and risks. And I'm wondering, as I listen to you and listen to the other speakers, you know, to what extent uh, the answer is that it can't be, we can't risk the failure your, frame or, your phrasing was uh, of unilateral peacemaking. I mean, coming back to the suggestion that was made before, that somehow there needs to be a U.S.-led effort, but a U.S.-led effort that involves significantly more players than we did in the 90s, certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm curious whether perhaps broadening the effort, making it less unilateral, is the answer for the next president, because I don't think disengagement is going to be a viable option. Look, look progress on, on the Arab-Israeli negotiations involves two things. Can you produce an agreement, conflict ending or otherwise, between Israelis and Palestinians? And can you produce an Israeli-Syrian agreement? You have two peace treaties already. They're not perfect. Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Israel, they've held. The, the disengagement agreement on the Golan has made the Israeli-Syrian border the stablest, the quietest. Lebanon's another matter, but it will come along with an Israeli-Syrian agreement. So the reality is, can you produce progress on either of these two tracks, by yourself, with others? That's, it, it, in my judgment, less relevant than the larger question. Will the next president of the United States, John McCain or Barack Obama, assert the will and the toughness and the creativity and the tactical agility required to take on one of the two most difficult or both negotiations, the last two tough pieces, which involve very difficult choices for Israelis and Syrians and Israelis and Palestinians. Assuming they're prepared to make the choices, are we? I, I do not, and I will, I'll be very, I'll speak personally here. I do not, I know what is required to negotiate successfully any agreement between Israelis and Palestinians or Israelis and Syrians. I do not see on the horizon the kind of boldness and toughness required by America to do that. Now, I could be surprised by either of these two presidents. Perhaps one or both will somehow understand the importance, appoint a Secretary of State that is tough enough and smart enough, a Kissinger and or a Baker, good luck trying to find one of those these days, and to create the changes in our software, in my judgment, that are required. That, those are tough changes in our software. We haven't seen those for 16 years. Now, have they disappeared permanently? I don't know, I can't say that. But I'm not terribly hopeful that a young, untested president will want to venture into this in a major way unless there's a prospect of success. Nor am I persuaded that John McCain, who thinks much more strategically about questions involving Iraq, honor, and American credibility, and who's likely to be much tougher when it comes to engaging Iran or playing a role as a mediator in a putative Israeli-Syrian agreement, will also be willing to take this on. Last comment. There are two clocks that are ticking for the next president in this region. Neither of them, frankly, are Arab-Israeli clocks. One is the campaign commitments made by both men to extricate America from this trillion dollar social science project that has come to be known as Iraq, which has set up America for a major failure, even under the best of circumstances. We've paid a terrible price. The question is not 10 years from now whether Iraq will emerge as a stable polity. I hope it does. The question is, what has it cost us? That's the right question. That clock is ticking. Republicans and Democrats, Americans will want an answer from the next president about Iraq.
And the other clock that is ticking is the Iranian clock with respect to enrichment and weaponization. And at what point does the Israeli tail begin to start wagging with respect to the urgency of dealing with this issue? These are the two problems that the next president will have to deal with urgently. And unless there's a sufficient reason from the Arabs and the Israelis, either they do things so galactically terrible to one another that we're forced to involve ourselves, or we find a way that they stand up in a way that is hard for me to understand, we're not going to jump into this, in my view. I'm sorry, again, for the extended answer. Just, just briefly, I mean, I, I, I want to depress you, Aaron. Um, not intentionally. The, um, look, the, the, the thing that most depressed me, by the way, about your book was the conclusion, 16 years. That I came out of it thinking, is, is the software just now structurally defective? Can, can you go, the, the example, because the examples you give are all so long ago in that respect, that really worried me. But there's the flip side to that. You, I think, correctly call this administration, and, and albeit Annapolis kind of started just as you were closing the book, but you called this, this administration the disengager, and yet what has happened with this administration? In her term as Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice has now been to Israel 21 times. So I think you're absolutely right, Mr. Shapiro. I think any administration gets sucked into this. I think they get sucked into it in no small measure, not only because they're thinking legacy, but because of the nature of the Israel relationship. So I think this is a very hard decision for America. You're going to get sucked into this. If there's a change of regime in Egypt, it's going to appear much higher on your priorities than it would otherwise because of the nature of relationship with Israel. So I actually would posit to you that, that this isn't just an Israeli or a Palestinian problem. You've got a serious problem here. Well, one last comment. We are already sucked in. We're, we're in an investment trap in a dysfunctional, conflict-ridden region which is angry and humiliated, all right? We can't fix this quickly, and we can't leave. We're, we're already stuck. But, but, but you're saying if, if, if you guys, the local actors, I, don't have enough pain or don't give up enough a sense of a gain, then we're not going to be able to do it. And I say you're stuck with this, so at some stage you've got to ask yourselves, do we not have to change our software? Unfortunately, I agree with you. You're not going to, but. Let's have one last question, perhaps. A brief question, anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Anne Marie Roberts, I'm with the Institute for Multi Track Diplomacy. Um, it occurred to me that the uh, separation barrier as a structure is both a, a physical and ideological obstacle to any progress. And I'm wondering if any of you see the wall coming down in the next five to ten years, or if there is a prospect for peace while it stands. I believe there is a prospect for peace as it stands right now. It complicates matters. Uh, I personally lump the wall along the same uh, category as settlements. Physical structures can be removed, can be changed, but the political cost is increased. And every time that we have a new settlement, a new bit of the wall, it gets so much more difficult. But we have not yet gotten to a point where I think uh, it, it has become physically uh, impossible. The problem with the wall and the settlements is primarily political. The kind of political message it sends to the public, how can you defend negotiating when uh, the opposition said, look, uh, says, look, Israel is grabbing land as you're negotiating. So it's the political uh, message. It's the way that it undermines the legitimacy of anyone who negotiates. That's what bothered me more, more the, than anything else. The logistics of it is not that complicated, in my view. three panelists a uh, chance for any final thoughts uh, and uh, to frame it in the sense if anyone did want to take me up on this offer if you've got President Obain, uh, Obain. <laughs> if you've got President Obama or President McCain in the room and you have the chance for just three short messages uh, on Arab Israeli peacemaking what would they be um, just a hypothetical I'll, I'll, have, I'll give two short messages number one pay attention to the past. Uh, we don't. And um, that's a criti critical failure. Um, and number two, see the world the way it is, not the way you want it to be, which is an, a, a very important lesson whether it concerns making peace or making war. 
Because if I were to cite one single fact that has created the mess in which we are now in by both Democratic administrations with respect to peacemaking, eight years of Bill Clinton, and certainly the galactic failures of eight years of George W. Bush, it is that single fact. We do not see the world the way it really is. We want to see it the way we want it to be. And it is a prescription for failure and disaster. I'd, I'd say, that, well, you're sucked in. You're going to be more and more sucked into it. Either the Middle East will set the agenda for you, or you'll try and set the agenda for it. And I would suggest the latter. Secondly, read Aaron Miller's book, and then read the uh, Dan Kurtz of Scott Lazinski, um, USIP study as a dessert. And thirdly, you figure it out. If you think that the current American disposition towards the Arab-Israeli conflict serves American interests, then just keep on going as you are. If you don't, you act on it. It's always horrible to speak after Daniel because you take my ideas, but I would then repeat it. Uh, you're stuck with it. You're stuck with it. Uh, you can either make it a failure or a success, um, but you cannot ignore it. Uh, it's going to come back to haunt you. You define the agenda and don't let it be defined by others. The other one is diplomacy is not only glamorous uh, photo ops. Diplomacy is a lot of tedious work that needs to be done by co competent, capable uh, people. The sooner you understand this, the more you have a chance for success. The sooner that if you think that just by visiting and by being there, by your personal involvement, you're going to solve everything, you're very wrong. I only get two points on and a third. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ter term limits. Um, I came up with this idea several years ago. Um, no one who served for any length of time as an advisor to a president or a secretary of state, particularly when that advice led to policies that did not succeed, I won't call them failures, in respect to my colleagues, should be allowed or permitted. Unfortunately, Congress can't legislate this, and there's no executive order that would mandate it. No one who served in these capacities should be permitted to do so again. We need people who are detached from these issues. We need people who are able to bring fresh ex fresh ideas to them. They can consult these people all they want, but in no way, shape, or form should they be given any additional responsibility. Um, and I would put myself uh, at the top of the list. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, on that note, uh, I just want to thank the three panelists that we have here, Gaith Alamari, Daniel Levy, and Aaron Miller. I want to thank you all for coming, all those in the real world and in the virtual world. Have a great day and a relaxing weekend. Thank you all. Thank you.